Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lessons of the Woods by 10 Point White Tails. This time, we are here to discuss solutions instead of problems, like our two episodes ago when we had the Department of No Reason. Uh, I'm your host, Dylan Porter. With me, I have our co-host, Kyle Weber, and we're going to kind of talk over some ideas that we would have for a... QDMA is such a nice word to use, quality to your management, but it's not going to be attached to any... It's not attached to the actual organization of QDMA. It just fits that description to an extent. But this would be some ideas that I've worked on over the years. Kyle's got ideas, and we're going to try to lay them out if we ever did want to start a hunting club. And if everybody says, nah, you guys are crazy, that'll never work. You're wasting your time. Fine. But this is what we would do if we were to start a hunting club of some sort. Uh, anything you want to add there, or should I jump into my one page plan that I've drawn up? <laughs> um, <laughs> not so much, but you know, this, this topic can be heated as far as what people consider, um, the proper route. Mm -hmm. I think what you're going to suggest or what we are suggesting is just a steps to better, better, increase the experience that people gain hunting it's not necessarily to gain trophy hunting it's not necessarily to strictly control what gets harvested but it is to increase the experience of hunting and the sport of hunting in general yeah so. and, and encourage herd health which i think is one of the biggest things that i would want to promote is herd health because in a lot of parts of Minnesota and a lot of Wisconsin, the deer herd isn't as healthy as it could be. There's ways to improve that, whether it's by raising the deer numbers, raising the feed, uh, encouraging healthier does, healthier births. There's a lot of things that we can do there. Um, so the idea behind this club is to encourage herd health and get people on board and also to not feel like you have to fill your rifle tag. Uh, so obviously there'd be a fee to join any hunting club there's a fee and there has to be a fee to fund banquets or fund uh raffles or whatever so that would be a lot of paperwork that well, somebody will figure out if we end up doing that probably me but maybe not uh but a fee so if we were to start a club what's a reasonable fee like i've never been a member of mdha or qdam qd qdma uh i was a member of the minnesota hunting club at one point i think that was a fifty dollars a year i think but they also sent you a hoodie with that so i don't know for sure do you have any experience in that area not necessarily but i you know 25 25 bucks 50 bucks um i think the point of the fee is not so much to to re not revenue but i think what you receive as this club grows the would would be the the value would be over and above and beyond the twenty five dollar fee. Like whether it's twenty five, fifty, ten, um, I think the value in return, like you said, a sweatshirt. Well, now obviously you have a sweatshirt um, that's got some value to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, twenty five, fifty, you know, it depends on what you, what the club is providing, and uh, you know, I'm I am part of the Rocky Mountain elk foundation i can't tell you what the fee was but um i am i am a supporter of that so um 25 50 sure 25 just something 25. To, to fund the organization right you got to have a fund so there has to be a fee not everything life not everything in life is free unfortunately so has to be a fee everybody understands that i think uh one thing that would be fun with this, so if especially with landowners, right? Because we're trying to improve. If we're trying to improve management, it'd be fun as a landowner. Let's say in a ten mile square, there's fifteen landowners, and fourteen of them have agreed to this idea. Now those numbers are probably not accurate. That it's a lot of land for fourteen people, but fourteen of them have agreed to whatever plan we're going to come up with here. It would be fun to be able to take a highlighted a map whether it's online or in person and it's highlighted and go to your 15th neighbor here and say, Hey, this is what we've all agreed to look at. You're the only one that hasn't 
decided to try to go with this, let's all do it. And this type of thing, I've seen it actually put in place in one spot in Minnesota, but I don't remember the, the area, but they had something similar to this. So this is kind of what I'm basing all of this off of. And they might have even been free. I don't remember. But it's just, hey, this is we're all agreeing to this type of standard for what we want to do for our deer in our area. Okay? Uh, so that can help add a little bit of pressure to the people who don't want to join. You know, peer pressure is a good thing sometimes, right? Hey, mm-hmm. look, everybody mm-hmm. else is doing it. We, I, You should too. Um, but my thoughts are members, if they join a club like this or this club, if hypothetical club, they must agree to some version of the following. Number one, I think everybody who is going to be hunting, not just the member of the club, but the member's family should either take a brief online course or get a, at least bare minimum, a YouTube video or a pamphlet, right? Simple on how to age a white tailed deer on the hoof, a buck. Cause there's so many people that I've seen out there that see a buck, they think it's a lot older than it is. And you can tell under three years of age, pretty pretty much 95% of the time how old the buck is. So I think that's something that should be included in that. If it's, apl- ac- blah, 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 blah. If it's applicable in your area, should be a earn, a, earn a buck. So you sh- if you can shoot a buck in a doe, Shoot your doe, register your doe, then fill your buck tag. Because what that does, not for Kyle, but for other people, it gets rid of that itchy trigger finger. It's been a year, you haven't shot a deer, you want to shoot a deer. So instead of shooting the first spike buck you see, you shoot a doe, you take it home, you clean it, you get it in the freezer, or off to the locker plant. Your hands have gotten bloody. You've kind of taken some of that little bit of edge off. Now you can feel comfortable shooting a buck. And if you sit planning on shooting a doe, it's entirely possible. You see a pretty nice buck walk by that you can't shoot yet because you haven't shot your doe. Now, granted, these are gentlemen's agreement. It's not like, oh, you shot a buck first, too bad. Now we got to write you a ticket. No, right. gentlemen's agreement. There's no way to enforce this. It's just this is the standard we would like to hold. We would like to hold this. No penalties. We'd like to hold it. Uh, if it's a first-time hunter or you're under 18, shoot whatever you want. Do- shoot within the legal rules, shoot whatever you want. Because I truly believe that young people and first time hunters need to have an experience of harvesting an animal almost as fast as possible. Because if it's a cold rifle season or they're too old for the youth season and you sit for four days, you don't see anything that you can shoot or you see two spike bucks like, no, I'm gonna wait for a big one, which I admire in a young person. But you can get burned out on that and decide, you know, hunting wasn't that fun. So if we can say, hey, you're under 18 or you haven't shot a buck yet, you are clear, shoot whatever you want. First thing with antlers, make yourself feel that adrenaline rush, feel that experience and move forward with that, okay? For everybody else, harvest a buck equal to or bigger than what you harvested last year. Now there's people who say, oh, we need the meat. You don't need the meat. Nobody needs the meat. Venison's very expensive meat. Trust me, by the time you pay for your rifle, your bullets, days off of work, tree stands, a lot of people have up here box blinds, and those run minimum 1500 bucks to way more. Mm-hmm. Even if they're homemade, they run a lot. By the time you get your 30 pounds of venison back that you paid a locker plant to process, which I've never done, so I don't actually know what that costs. Um, you can see uh- Bare minimum, 150 bucks. I brought, I think, two deer in that was all deboned, got it into pepperoni sticks and brats, and it was 500 bucks. So, okay, so two deer deboned, that's about 60 pounds of meat, roughly, give or take. It was 52. Hey, I was pretty close. 52 <laughs> pounds of meat, uh, 500 bucks. That's 10 bucks a pound, and that's just the locker plant fees. So if you need meat, venison's not cheap. Go buy half a cow. Okay? Venison's not cheap. Nobody needs the meat anymore. And if you do need the meat, you didn't hear it from me, just poach them. Nobody cares. <laughs> just, just kidding. Don't poach deer. But if you need the meat, there's ways to get meat. Okay? So, if you don't fail your buck tag, here's the fun part of this. If 
you don't fill your buck tag because you didn't see a buck bigger than you shot last year or the same size as you shot last year, every unfilled buck tag is el- gets entered into a raffle. So at the end of the year, each club, chapter, whatever, group of landowners in the area, even if it's not a real club, just a group of landowners, you guys have a banquet, okay? And at the banquet, everybody gets to tell their deer hunting stories. You can bring in a speaker if you want. Actually, this is why I know this exists because dad was a speaker one year. They brought him in, this particular group. And every unfilled buck tag, and you can do unfilled doe tags too. If you haven't registered your tag, it's unfilled, drop it in a bucket on your way in. And there's prizes for that. If you don't fill your buck tag, instead of getting tag soup, you could maybe win a buddy heater or a rifle or any variety of prizes. That way, if you don't fill your tag, you don't feel as bad about it. So a lot of people are like, oh, I paid 30 bucks for the tag. I suppose I should fill it. Yes and no, right? Okay. Prizes are great. Everybody loves prizes. Everybody loves getting stuff for free. Well, not for free. You pay $30 to the Minnesota DNR to get it. But you know what I'm saying, right? Okay. Last thing that it, it would be fun with these clubs is somehow figure out an incentive program for harvesting coyotes. Right? So if you could say to all the landowners in this club, say, hey, you got a young kid hunting on your property, 16 years old. We'll pay him 20 bucks for each coyote he shoots or 10 bucks or every coyote he shoots and he mails us the tail because I think furs are worth almost nothing right now he's entered into a drawing for a new rifle. I mean, there's just a lot of incentives there. Granted, this stuff's got to be paid for somehow, but I think it's got some solid bones. Some things might need to be tweaked. Am I crazy, Kyle? What do you think? No, um, I talked to a few people that were down like in the lacrosse area, and they did something similar. It was, it was QDM. So QDMA, National Deer Association, um, those are organizations. So QDM is a process, quality deer management. You're managing deer for quality. Quality deer management, deer quality. Um, so the goal, the goal of the whole process would be to get a group together that has the same mindset, has the same gentleman's agreement to say, we're going to harvest this. We're not going to harvest this. We're going to do it this form to increase the quality in this general area. And if I knew my neighbor to the left and my neighbor to the right, my neighbor to the north won't shoot this fork, I won't shoot this fork because it's not a race to get to the fork. And that's a fork. That's an eight point or whatever it is that quality turns into quantity of quality and now everybody in the group, I have a great, co- everybody in the group can enjoy quality hunting and quality memories and quality experiences. Um, things have to happen. There has to be, if you know, I mean, we could do kind of just volunteer only, but there should be a fee that provides for the banquet, that provides for giveaways and, and sweatshirts and stuff like that. It also put, puts you into a pool of people that are like, like-minded on these topics and like you said if if everything's highlighted for a for a whole section 300 or 640 acres except for this 160 here you can go to them and be like hey all of us are kind of doing this can you do you do you agree do you think this is a fair way to to handle management deer management and you hope they join but i think you know a little tweak i would maybe make is that and I can't think of the name now. Bayfield County has this community <clears throat> get to, uh, It's not a get together. It's there's a board. It's a board of directors basically that talks about the deer population in um, Bayfield County and Bayfield County Deer CC. Uh, I'll have to find it anyway. Anyways, it's a group of people that are just community members that basically vote on certain things. They talk. They talk to the DNR in Bayfield County and what should happen and da, da 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 And they lobby in a way to suggest what they think Bayfield County needs. And I know you had talked about, like, rather than these generic zones, you county-to-county county reflection um, is more accurate, obviously. And if they can be managed, if this county can manage this way, this county can manage this way, 
it shrinks down that it goes microeconomics rather than macroeconomics. You know, people in Kitson County might refer differently than uh, Roseau. You know, Bayfield County is substantially different than Sawyer or Washburn. And if it went down to a micro style rather than deciding what this general area needs. But what I was going to get to was paying the f- funding that um, organization and grouping those people together may also allow that club to lobby at, go to these meetings, go get the DNR's number, get the, um, the state DNR. Oh, what's the title? Uh, what is it? Commissioner. The commissioner, the DNR commissioner. You know, imagine if, imagine if the, the Minnesota DNR commissioner received numerous phone calls from a club club members referencing herd numbers Mm -hmm. cwd issues quality of animals you know you're lobbying then to in essence politicians and and making the laws that happens in minnesota mdha has a powerful voice uh bluffland whitetails has a very powerful voice and both of those organizations are anti-deer farms they're anti-deer farms, sure. and they're anti-helping white-tailed deer grow. They don't come yep. out and say that, but they do say they're anti-deer farms in their mission statements. And they are both in the DNR's back pocket, unfortunately. So they, yep. they whatever whatever the DNR say, these, these organizations are like, yep, that's a great idea. Yep, the DNR, they're 100% right all the time. That's what their organ, their leadership says. Uh, MDHA's, actu- their MDHA's president, who actually just quit due to dad, in the last year or so. Uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now, but he was... Ingwald? Yep, Chris Ingwald. He was the vice president. Somebody's been doing their homework. Uh, either the vice president or the president of the MDHA, and he was a DNR attack dog for many years prior to becoming the MDHA president, meaning he was a lawyer that worked for the MDHA to sue landowners. That's what he did. Just beat him up. So, yep, so he was in the DNR's back pocket. So we need an organization that is not in the DNR's back pocket that can lobby against the DNR, not not to get rid of the DNR. We need management of some sort, but to say, hey, we disagree with there not being a wolf season. We disagree with how you're handling XYZ or CWD for just using letters, right? Any letters work. But yep. a club absolutely gives you that power, especially once you have a lot of members. So there so, is definite benefits to instead of just being a group of individuals who agree to this and do it on their own to having a statewide club that says, "Hey, this needs to change." Yep, yeah. and I don't, and I don't, I, I'm upset with myself that I don't know the name, but the group, the board that manages in Bayfield County, uh, it is re- it is reflected with the DNR. The DNR have met with them. It's all about management of the Bayfield County deer herd, basically. And at one point, I knew somebody that was on it, and they were pushing slash talking about management. And the DNR representative quoted, we will never manage our hunting season. Our hunting season will never manage for trophy whitetails. Their interest is not in managing trophy white, and I'm not necessarily managing for trophy whitetails. I'm talking management for a healthy herd, for healthy deer population, for a good buck to doe ratio, so that every hunter can have a experience in the woods. So it's not just trophies because trophies are so. It's based on perspective. A 300 inch deer is a trophy to some people, but a spike is a trophy to the other person. Mm-hmm. But Imagine if at that meeting there was 12 like-minded people, part of Dylan Porter's special club. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Named TBD. Definitely. Not calling it that. um, Nope. Imagine if they're all sitting in there. And and I I am on a town board. I'm, I'm a town supervisor. And there is a significant amount of pressure when the seats are full. You pay attention. I don't want to say I'm lax the day days of cold. When there's nobody there, I'm still care I care about the issues and I care about the factors ahead of me, but 
when there's a when there's a group in there and they're all looking at you wanting to know what you're gonna say because you are a representative imagine if a dozen club members based on communicating based on this information and being in this like-minded group in this club could go to that meeting and sit there and then when they say things that are just asinine we will never manage the trophy whitetails excuse me why well it's a tradition over it's not it's not it's not about trophies it's about tradition excuse me you got rid of the tradition you you eliminated the tradition five ten years ago so what are your goals and you get down to the nitty-gritty revenue Mm-hmm. And imagine supporting the club. So when you join the club, you're agreeing to these stipulations. You're like-minded like the rest of the group. You can share your mindset. You can share your experiences. But then also banquet, prizes and gifts, etc. But what mm-hmm. also happens is you group you group these people together to have good, healthy conversations to speak on behalf of the hunters. Mm-hmm. The DNR never talked to a hunter. Hey, they I, talk what are to you the seeing? heads of two clubs that have all the power, and their yes. those two clubs are in their back pocket. Chris Ingwald and Representative Rick Hansen with the politician were good friends, to my understanding, and also Lou Cornicelli. I mean, those guys were all hand holding Lion hands. Lou. Lion Lou. Holding hands, walking through in doing whatever they want from a legislative standpoint with white-tailed deer. Yep, and I just, I mean that 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 statement will never match for trophies. You, you're you're so you're so out of touch. And if a group can get together and think, think likewise about, we just want to have good experiences in the woods. Like I was saying, no DNR officer has ever pulled up and been like, "Are you having a good time?" They're like, we're going to get you. We want your, you are bad. You are guilty. We will make you guilty. We will find you guilty. We're going to switch the rules. We're going to change the rule book. We're going to push it. We're but not, not about it. Are you having fun? No, no, no. Are you breaking the law? The laws that we implemented for some generic unnecessary reason, the agenda, but a little pushback, you know, if you could have a dozen people go to that Bayfield County meeting and just ask why, how, who, when, where, why, how, it puts pressure on that board when they're making decisions that they can't just do whatever they want, however they want it, you know. Um, but that's the support that also this club would provide, I hope, would be, I don't want to say lobbying because then it just makes you a politician and you're just working for your agenda. But in a sense, it is. It is. It is. It, it is. Even the Minnesota Deer Farm Association hires lobbyists. Every organization hires lobbyists. They have yep. to to help encourage laws that need to be there for them, or discourage laws that are directly attacking them or shutting them down. Uh, so yeah, a club can provide that type of support at a state level, but in Minnesota, and I'm assuming Wisconsin too, we have to realize that the DNR will never change things for better. So we have to start at a local level. And if we can get 20,000 acres signed up for this type of program, that's 20,000 acres that are encouraging healthy deer that are making their herd better. Because we can not shoot deer. We can choose to not shoot deer. What are they going to do? Sell us more tickets? More, More tags? They'll probably try, but if we're saying no, we want to ha- we want to control our deer population to make it better for us. It's as simple as this: making a gentleman's agreement and not shooting, and not shooting deer, or shooting appropriate deer, shooting right. bigger bucks, or in the case of like our last episode, shooting a buck that's clearly older and poor genetically, or just not healthy. We can encourage a healthy herd from a local level if we can get people to agree on stuff, which that's the tricky part. You know as well as I do, any group or meeting involving five or more people gets tough to get everybody to agree on everything. Yeah, <clears throat> but you can, you'll never get everybody to agree on everything, but you can get a majority to agree for the betterment. Mm-hmm. It's one thing I focus with the, the town, uh, being a supervisor. It's not what 
Billy Bob wants. It's not what Jim needs. It's not what George wants. It's it's about what's better. For, and, and I hate to say that it's better for the 51%. Mm-hmm. The majority. You want the best for the community. In this case, it's best for the herd. It's best for the hunters. And it's purely to make a better experience. You know, I don't care... <clears throat> I don't care about what the size is. I just care about that it's a good experience. Did you have fun? Did you harvest the animal you wanted to harvest? Did you harvest? Mm-hmm. You know, your 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 suggestions suggest higher antler, you know, less buck harvest, which is just it's just a buy it's a byproduct well, of a healthy herd. Yeah, it's a byproduct of a healthy herd, it's a byproduct of the end goal. I mean, if all of us could go shoot a 170-inch deer, that would be great. But how do we get there? Take the antlers right out of it. If it is for meat, a two- or a three-year-old buck has almost double the meat of a year-and-a-half-old buck. If it's all for meat. I've pulled 40-plus pounds of meat off of a buck before. I've pulled 60 pounds of meat off a buck before. I have. I had to do math in my head again, double check. But I've pulled 60 pounds of meat off a buck. I shot a two-year-old buck this year. I got six gallons of hamburger meat. Six gallons. Yep. They have a lot of meat on them if they get some age. So why, if we're spending all this money on tags and processing and everything else, why wouldn't we want to shoot a bigger body deer? Yep. Just bigger body. Not even antler size, just bigger body. Because if your does are living longer, if your does are healthier, they get bigger body. I've seen does that are nearly 200 pounds. Live weight. I've sure. I've, I've seen deer that does that dress over 150. I think I have a 200 pounder at the house here. Probably where you are right there. He's a, yeah. he's a big old nanny. He's huge. We had a doe it's one just, time on the farm that had 300 pound genetics in her. <laughs> we thought she was pregnant her first year and we're like, man, she's got five fawns in there. She's huge. She had one. <laughs> but she, we're like, she's bigger than most of our bucks body wise. She's huge. One fawn. Yep. Not even a big fawn. One average fawn. <laughs> you know, and we talk about this club, and, and, and it's, I love it because it's put, it formalizes, it makes it a formality rather than just kind of, I mean, you talk about gentleman's agreement, but it makes it formal. Mm-hmm. You're paying, you're, you're getting rewarded, there'll be a forum, there'll be a communication line. Monthly newsletters that have, maybe yep. we get information from people who know a lot more than we do, which there's a lot of people yep. out there, but we can get articles written by people, uh, even recycling stuff from years ago we can get online um online videos or resources and just provide resources and education to people and that's that's the biggest thing is is providing this education for people to make educated decisions when they're hunting instead of if it's it's down right and i got a group around me that um i think for the most part we share pictures Hey, this, uh, you know, he was like, Hey, I, sh- I heard a A pointer got shot. I go, Was it this one, this one, or this one? And he, you know, I think it's honest. I, but if you knew your neighbor was going to pass that eight pointer, that two and a half year old eight pointer, you know that because we all agreed it's a two and a half year old that needs to see three and a half. Mm-hmm. And, and- you went, you're not going to shoot it. You're not beating your neighbor because you know he's good. And now he might go three lo- properties down and get shot, but that's part of the world. But if you know your general area is going to protect, well, if, deer herd. if you have 600 acres agreeing to something, 600 acres, whether it's one guy or five guys that own that 600 acres, all agreeing, yeah, we're not going to shoot that, that's 600 acres of safety for that particular yep. deer. And that's my biggest pet peeve in the world. Everybody always says, well, if I don't shoot it, my neighbor will. Yeah, yep. but if you shoot it, it's dead. If you don't shoot it, there's still a chance your neighbor won't. Yeah. This, this eliminates that mindset like you're saying we get rid of that oh, i gotta shoot it before my neighbor does yeah you go you go south in wisconsin here and we get to like the big buck country buffalo county and lacrosse and eau claire and all this stuff and they're like oh it's so big it's like, do you know why i mean those genetics are here we have a food issue right where i'm at we have a food issue but the reason they're so big is because all of them people agree to shoot bigger deer i mean they're not shooting i mean down in 
Hudson and, and Madison and all these areas, like the the easiest way to pass on a big deer is to have a giant deer, right? Mm-hmm. It's really easy to pass that 150. If you know there's a 170 that could walk out at any time, we just got to get, and then, then it naturally happens. People naturally pass on the two and three year old. People naturally pass on the 140s, 120s because there's a 160 or 170 chance. And that's big enough. You might eat tag soup because you want him next year. So we just got to get to that point to have that lure kind of dangling out in front of the hunters because then they'll naturally QDM themselves. Mm -hmm. But the reason down them counties have that is because they've all agreed we don't need to shoot a fork. We are trophy hunting. We, you know, if we want meat, we have plenty of does because there's plenty of food. So there's plenty of does. So if we want meat, we shoot a doe. But if we want trophies, don't shoot a fork. Don't shoot a six. Don't shoot a 120-inch eight because a good buck will never be a great buck if you blow a hole through them. And they've done that. And it's really simple, but it's really difficult to for everybody to agree. Because yeah. what happens is you get 15 people to say, yeah, only big ones. I'm, I'm being generic here. Yeah, only big ones. And that one guy's like, oh, boom, boom, and, and ruins it. So yeah. this gentleman's agreement is is important and can really benefit everybody. And then if you look at a map and you can, like you're saying, a highlighted map, and you can see this whole group, now that property next to it might sell. You know, if if this if this section's all yellow and somebody wants to buy the 160 next to it, they're like, oh, but it's right next to some." premier Dylan special club land. I mean, I'm not calling it that. <laughs> I might D S C. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, that, that can benefit. That can benefit it also. Yeah. So and, and there's a, not just Buffalo County and, and I think Hudson, you said, but there's a section in Minnesota that is around Purim. That's all I'll say. Cause I don't know the exact location, but, Purim area, they shoot more big bucks down in that area than a lot of places in Minnesota. And I'm talking 180s to 200 plusers. Why? Because they know, hey, we started letting the little ones grow and now they're big ones. And yeah, there's a lot of egg down there. There's a good deer population. So is there in a majority of the northern half of Minnesota. I mean, the northwest side. The south southern half of Minnesota is all egg and all deer other when, than where the DNR are killing everything in the CWD area, but that's another topic. We have the genetics. We have the deer. We have zero age structure. This is a way to encourage age structure in Minnesota, encourage feeding and age structure in Wisconsin, and allow deer to become what they should be and harvest mature animals instead of year-and-a-half-old animals. And that's really all there all, all there is to it is a it's a gentleman's agreement because we have we're not any sort of enforcement agency so even if we started this club what is there going to be a five dollar fine and how do we enforce that we can't babysit everybody it'd have to be a gentleman's agreement and just you're trying to better your herd that's all there is to it because there's no way to enforce anything because we're not the law in Minnesota or Wisconsin and we can and if but if you're Jordan you can hopefully as as it grows and as it gains traction there's more benefits there's more resources on our behalf to help landowners you know hey this landowner is saying they're struggling with the deer population right now but the state of minnesota the kitson county or however it's being set up is talking about adding five thousand doe tags but that that farmer that hunter that that club member just said there there's nothing it's like well where are these deer that they supposedly want us to shoot you know i always buy a rifle tag even though i plan didn't plan to hunt this year why because it gives them their quota for the tag that they want and i didn't shoot a deer i saved in my opinion two deer a doe and a buck hmm. that's an they want to look at it they only care about the revenue and their quota now, they'll if nobody buys a license, they'll change the rules to make people every. They might let people shoot deer at night if they lose enough licenses. Oh, it's all. All right, we're gonna have and, a night hunt, one weekend. Hey, that'd be kind of awesome, license. though. <laughs> it, it, don't 
Dinar, you can't steal. That's mine. Don't even <laughs> Patent steal pending. Yeah. Um, uh, well, enough teenagers around here have done that anyway. So. <laughs> Never me. Nope, not me. Um. <laughs> but um, they want the revenue. They want their quota. They, that's fine. And if I buy a license, give them their quota. Don't fill a tag. The percentage hurts. We talked about that. Was Minnesota's at about 30% harvest. 30% success rate, yep. We were about 50. If I don't harvest anything, but I buy a license, I buy both tags, I'm kind of hurting their numbers a little bit. Call it an inaccuracy. But, I mean, I did sit. I did hunt. If a deer would have walked out worth shooting, I would have shot it. But I knew my intentions weren't to sit nine days and go crazy. I, I wasn't doing that. I was actually out of state. But they had... <laughs> Ask any DNR, and I don't mean the agent. I don't mean the officer that is in his boat or in his truck on the road. I don't, don't not them. They're just doing a job, following the rules that they're supposed to. They're the weapons. They're the they're the puppet to the thing. But ask anybody that represents the DNR on that level, not on an officer level, but on on the next level up. What's your intentions? What do you want? What is your goal? Mm-hmm. What's different than last year, this year that you're going to make to improve? What is it? Well, we were down 30,000 licenses last year. Our revenue stream was down about $250,000. We're hoping to up that number. Oh, money? Licenses. I would love to, and I'll, I'll look this up. How many licenses were sold in Montana? You know, they don't, Montana doesn't even count how many harvests there are. You don't have to register your deer. What? That's crazy. If you drive past the checkpoint, which they put on major roads up into major hunting area, like if you're going to go hunt National Forest or BML, BLM land, and you go into a major city, town, there's usually a checkpoint. They'll wave you in. Get on it. Go over here. And you got to pull in. Let me see your license. Let me see your tag. What you got back there? How much, how'd you shoot it? Where'd you shoot it? Legal. Have a great day. Move on. They'll write you down. They'll, they'll take that information. But you don't call them and say, I shot this deer this day at this. Nope, they don't care. They do not care about the quantity because they do enough research and enough evidence and enough data to know this place has too many deer. This place got overhunted last year. We want to protect this area to develop larger deer. It's a less, less tags are given out, less licenses for this zone. That zone moves. But they don't care about the revenue. I mean, they... Their revenue works because they said $800 for a mule deer tag for a non-resident. Well, the reason you go out there is because there's a hope for a decent deer. Mm-hmm. And I referenced Wisconsin here, but Wisconsin could raise all of their licenses up, double double every single one. Mm-hmm. That means their revenue doubles. But you, ha- well, you have to have something worth paying for. So Buffalo County does. Outfitters are doing well down there. Tags are down there. Public, public land is horrible because there's nothing. But double your licenses. Make it make it twice as much. We're all still going to buy. You're going to get your revenue. But then, you know, cut the tags in half so we can get quality animals. We talk about cutting the tags in half. Well, 50% shoot deer anyways. So it's not like you're taking deer off people's tables. No. Just less tags. Or, thir- I mean, or 30% in Minnesota are successful. Why? Why yep. can't we sell 30% of the licenses and fill 100% of them? Yes. Right. And and if you're short, and, and I mean, I don't think, I'm not talking to resident. I'm talking non-residents. Licenses people going in to total. Minnesota. All. Yep. Yep. There should be a limit on it. And I think that's what we'll talk about next time, if we remember. I, I, drove, I, I wrote up a one-page plan for a hunting club. I have it two-page plan for what I'd do if I was in control of deer hunting in Minnesota. Uh, two whole pages. Mine's mine's about six lines. <laughs> Seriously. Save, save it, it for next time. Save it. Yep, but, but I mean, just a little <laughs> teaser. DNR ambassador, or, or what, what do we call it? Commissioner. Who's DNR, DNR commissioner. commissioner. You put Kyle Weber as DNR commissioner in, in Wisconsin. Five lines five rules that six lines six rules and in five years 
I, I really think the hunting experience would be considerably up. Every, every version of a hunter that we have, weapon, trophy, meat, age, all of those hunt, age, everybody would be happy. Everybody would be happy. Nobody would have much to complain about, and everybody would enjoy hunting again. Yep. There's ways to do it, but like we've been saying, it isn't going to start at a top level. It's got to start from the bottom up because it ain't starting top down. We're going to lay out our plans for it to start top down, which will never happen, but you guys can tell us if we're absolutely crazy or not in our next episode. Uh, I had a thought, and now I forgot it, that related to our current conversation. Uh Uh-oh. Completely lost it. It might come back to me. We'll see. So, shout out to uh, everyone last week that enjoyed our uh, Lessons of the Woods live event. Um, Let us know if you like that or if you want us to do more. I think it was kind of fun. Uh, Besides my computer just randomly shutting off because the battery was dead. Not random, but um, we are working with some guests to join us. Um, so things are going to get kind of fun in this off season, off season, I say, but probably after Christmas, I think we can start trying to pull some guests on, uh, just yeah. timing wise. Cause even yep. this one is going to go up. I think we're gonna have to record once or twice more yet, or probably once more sure. before Christmas. I think we might take well, a Christmas break. We'll see. You know, for, uh, you know, we can have an updated on what's happening at wit's end and, I can send you some of those pictures. I, I like that you pulled that screen up on our live event. So that was fun. We could prep more for that next time. Uh, also, I do like we do have that one more podcast that we can do after this, uh, one or two with our top down plan instead of the bottom up. Yep. Um, so we do have that topic coming up, and that'll get us right up to Christmas. Then we'll see what we have. We'll record one more time. We'll get two more podcasts in. Well, that'll get us through nice. the year. So, don't worry. You will hear us every Friday for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't knock down the doors, please. Yeah, yeah. Don't come after us if we're late. We know how it goes. Life is busy. <laughs> this is fun for us. It's not full time yet. 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 If you like what we have to say and you think we know what we're talking about, you could help us make it full time. We may even one day get a donate button to help us fund equipment, help us fund maybe hunting trips. No, prob- probably not hunting trips, but equipment better. Th- there's things that we could do better. Kyle could get a better camera for the future, but however, whatever you're using right now, killing it way better than your laptop, <laughs> <My iPad. laughs> way better than your laptop visually. So, uh, anything else before we sign off for the night? Did we cover if that? If you're interested enough? in joining a Dylan special club, reach out. I mean, I think if you, if you disagree with some of the facts or, or if you disagree with some of the thoughts we shared tonight regarding QDM, regarding Dylan's special club, let us know. Uh, be interesting to see what people think. And if it is something that maybe we need to set up and chase down, uh, if you're interested in being a part of that and would sign up to it, be interesting to see. So, Also, something else we've talked about, if we did end up doing a club like this, or at least establishing a 501c3, which is a nonprofit organization, tax number, whatever, uh, we would love to send deserving individuals on hunts, whether it's to uh, a hunting preserve or... S- some, something of that, whether well, pheasant hunt, we'd love to somehow connect with individuals and be able to fund hunting outdoor activities for them that they aren't that they would otherwise be unable to have. Is that a good way to phrase it for yep. generic as possible right now? Uh, yep. So that's something that a club like this or a 501c3 involved in a club like this could help us help people. Uh, I don't think either of us are planning on getting rich by any stretch of the imagination, but we do want to get as many people as possible enjoying the outdoors. Yep. And of all ages and all 
capabilities, Versions, capabilities, weapons, you know, the hunter versus hunter bash really, um, actually Dylan, you sent me that one, um, baiting is for weekend warriors. I, and I think we are not interested in having a competition on who does what better. Mm-hmm. If you shoot a spike and you're, you're, heart is racing and you're shaking and you're sweating or, or, or you just got some food on the table. If you shoot a 200 inch deer and you get heart racing and, or you get food on the table, I don't care if you're enjoying yourself, you're respecting the animal, you're doing it ethically. I don't care how you do it. I don't care what weapon you use. Now my thoughts for the DNR thing requires weapon seasons, but that's purely out of a different reason. That's not so that, Certain people using certain weapons don't have as much of an opportunity as others, but the bashing, the the Ohio, Illinois, Kansas, Oklahoma, they can all feed. They use it out of feeders. If somebody in Kissing County baits, it's worse or, than or, driving drunk. Your penalty is worse than driving drunk. Yeah, I mean this hunter versus hunter bashing just seems to just because you don't like it. I'm not a huge fan of some ways we hunt bears. Just not a fan of it. I don't think any lesser of those people. I just don't enjoy it that way. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, that club will be a community of which it's not about that. It's not about, oh, you should, I mean, it's about, it's about developing quality animals, but it's not about, oh, you shot a spike. Shame on you. It's, it's, was that your first deer? Did you enjoy it? Did you feed your family? Fine. I don't care. Quality animal. Fine. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking for larger antlers, older deer, a healthier herd, this we're supposed to help with too. But the hunter versus hunter bashing, call him baiting, cheating, weekend warriors. I think we got some industry things we need to work on. Uh, and um, it goes so far, the hunter bashing. It, I mean, longbow versus compound, compound versus crossbow, rifle versus in muzzleloader, muzzleloader versus muzzleloader with a scope, inline sights. I mean, some people, they talk like we should be using a spear or else it isn't fair chase. They say, oh, it's not fair chase to shoot a deer in a hunting preserve. You have a rifle that can shoot 1,200 yards at 3,000 feet per second. Don't talk fair chase. We're all hunting. We all enjoy the sport. Yes, we do it different ways. Everybody does it a different way. Everybody has their own little idiosyncrasies of how they want to hunt and harvest a deer. But we all got to get along. Yep. Because we all want to yep. shoot a quality animal. Regardless if it's for meat or if it's for antlers, we all want to shoot a quality animal, safely harvest that animal, and 95% of the people who hunt whitetails want to eat them. And the 5% that don't want to eat them, they give the meat to somebody who does. Yep. And it's and it's all based on the appreciation of the animal. Mm-hmm. That's why we taxidermy. That's why we mount these animals because we can appreciate them. You know, I mean, it's all about the appreciation of the animal, the story. People finally realize that in the industry that we want to hear the story of the animal. He was two, they look like this. Three, he looked like this. Four, he looked like this. We harvested him at five because he was this way. There's a story. We name our deer. The reason we name our deer is not because it's a pet. It's because it puts a connection. It puts a humane. Deer are not humans. They do not feel feelings like like humans do but when we name them when we have this story with them it puts a connection and appreciation for the animal i've seen people harvest deer and cry yeah because the story's over because because it happened all of this work all of this development all this stuff that happened it's just to appreciate the animal whether it's appreciating it appreciating it on your plate on your wall whether it's appreciating your son or your daughter next to you in that moment. I found I found a picture of me and Flynn, Flynn when we shot the six pointer. Littlest deer you could ever imagine. Not a big deal. But Flynn was shaking in his boots. He couldn't understand why. He said he was cold. It was 70 degrees in the blind. But he got buck fever. He got excited and he seen a successful hunt. That's why that, that buck is on this wall on my wall. Not because it was a monster trophy. It's because that deer was harvested and appreciated in that memory. Mm-hmm. That's connected. So um, quit with the hunter bashing. Quit hunt bashing yourself. 
just you know quit yeah. stop that there's nothing wrong with don't be when you shoot a deer well it's not as big as it could have been don't do that to yourself yeah you pulled the trigger you're happy with it don't justify your harvest to somebody else yep yep so if you shot it be happy with it because if you're not then why'd you shoot it uh, yep so there's no reason to justify yourself. Yes, we push shoot older deer, shoot better deer. That's what is better for the herd health. But your experience ultimately in the end is what matters. Not your neighbor's experience, not somebody else's experience that you've never met. Your own individual hunting experience is what matters. And sharing that with your family and friends. Right? Yep. End it on that. There Take we go. us out. So that's going to be the end of this episode. We kind of got really touchy-feely at the end, but it's got to happen. We get, It's got to happen. Uh, so tune in next time when we come up with more solutions for how we could fix hunting in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, you can find Lessons of the Woods every Friday at 7 p.m. Unless we do a live, then it comes out on Saturday, depending on where we put it. Uh, but it is on Facebook. That one will be at 7 p.m. every Friday. Uh, otherwise, you can find it on YouTube or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, CastBox. I think that's all of them. Uh, you can find it almost anywhere right now. We finally got it hooked up everywhere you want to find it. So find us where you found us. If you have any questions, comments, email us at 10pointwhitetails at gmail.com or message us on Facebook or comment on YouTube. I don't think you can comment on the other ones. Leave us a review on iTunes. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, leave us a review because that's huge on iTunes. Even if it's a bad... Well, don't leave us a bad review. Or do. I don't know. Leave us a review. We want to know what you think. Leave us a bad review. We'll read it. Talk it about off. it. And laugh no. about it in the next <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, anyway, thank you guys for watching. We'll be back next week, Friday, 7 p.m., with uh, more Lessons of the Woods. 